James Woods of Arizona. He is, yeah, round of applause. Not only is he out and proud and ran for office in Arizona, Jan Brewer, Arizona, he did that. Um, he also, you know, since the theme this year is, is, you know, activism and badassery, this dude right here sent the National Pro-Life Alliance campaign gifts. The Pro-Life Alliance says, abortion is wrong, it's murder, baby Jesus cries. And he said, well, you know what? If you want to prevent abortions, you probably should make birth control accessible, and I'm going to help you. Here are elect James Woods condoms, and he sent those. Yeah, give it up. Give it up. He sent those to the National Pro-Life Alliance. Here are some condoms. You want to stop abortions, do something that science and a lot of people who might have gone to college at the same time as I did, can vouch for actually work. Condoms, they are awesome, yay. Um, I'm, I'm holding you to the fact that uh, next time you run, you're sending me some so I can hand them out too. Um, I want everybody to put their hands together and welcome James Woods, atheist, candidate, badass to the stage here. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm blind, too. Uh, <laughs> the uh, parenthetical title for this talk, uh, if you were following the campaign, you probably know we are very fond of puns. Uh, my campaign slogan was help restore America's vision. Uh, this talk is, was titled uh, Shot in the Dark, a Blind Atheist Runs for Congress. Uh, the parenthetical title uh, could be uh, Political Trolling uh, for Fun and Awareness. Uh, as Jamila mentioned, we did send out uh, condoms. Well, I'm going to give a little more background to that in just a minute. I'm going to tell you a little about myself and what got me to run for Congress. Uh, because uh, any career politician will tell you running for a federal office, your first shot out, unless you are on the Forbes 400, is probably crazy. And even then, it still probably is. Um, I am a native Arizonan. I grew up and I'm a product of uh, public schools. My uh, professional background was information technology. And uh, I am a type 1 diabetic. That will be important shortly. In 2000, let's see, it would have been 2006, I contracted an antibiotic-resistant infection in my collarbone. Doctors think it might have gotten in through my teeth. Uh, at the time, I was working uh, on contract as a systems administrator for a mortgage company, right at the peak of the, of the uh, mortgage bubble, so I got to see some really shady loans going through at the same time. Uh, and my shoulders started hurting, so I went to the hospital, and they x-rayed me, and they said, well, Mr. Woods, you have a uh, osteomyelitis, which is a, a bone infection in your collarbone, and the only way to deal with that uh, is to cut out the bone. So I don't have about two inches of collarbone from here to here. Uh, they admitted me, they cut out the bone the next day, uh, started me on IV antibiotics, and that was in, I went into the hospital on October 20th of 2006. Uh, by January, the infection had started to poison my blood, and uh, my kidneys had failed. And a month before my 27th birthday, uh, my vision started going dim. 
I told the attending doctors that my vi I was having vision problems, and they said, well, we'll take care of that once we get your uh, infection under control. Uh, that Monday morning is when I reported it, because it happened over a weekend. By that Friday when I woke up, I was blind. I haven't seen anything since uh, January of 2007. It took 18 months of nursing homes and critical care facilities uh, before I was able to go home. I was in intensive care five times. I was as close as you can get to, to dying without actually taking, shuffling off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare might say. Uh, when I left the hospital, I weighed about 120 pounds, and I am just under six foot. That's not a good look, especially as broad as my shoulders are. I was wheelchair bound, and I basically had to relearn how to do everything by myself. Fast forward a couple years, I was able to get uh, help through uh, empowerment programs such as uh, Social Security Disability, uh, I was on food stamps for a while, uh, I was able to get uh, physical therapy through, so, uh, again, through uh, Social uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And I decided if I had the opportunity, I wanted to be in part of the conversation so that people had access to health care. It should be a universal right. And in the richest country in the world, <laughs> and it's disgusting that the richest country in the world is the only industrialized nation that doesn't have universal access. So I started uh, going to some local meetings. And the first one I would attended was an FFRF meeting. Uh, the president of the Phoenix chapter, uh, a woman named Ann Mardick, convinced me uh, very shortly to be on one of the FFRF coming out billboards. So that was my first political action, was being on one of the FFRF coming out billboards. <laughs> Then I got involved with Americans United for Separation Church and State, Secular Coalition, and it just started snowballing. I started going to my local uh, legislative district meetings. Uh, surprise, I'm a Democrat. Um, <laughs> my third meeting, I was elected to uh, secretary. I was a board member, and it was kind of amusing to me that the blind guy was the secretary. <laughs> and that's really where it started, because it was right about the beginning of the election cycle in 2013, and they put out a call for candidates. At first, I thought I was going to run for the state legislature because there was a couple particularly awful people in my home district. Uh, and one of them is a Christian Dominionist uh, who I very much uh, would like to see uh, go into a much deserved early retirement. Unfortunately, he was reelected this cycle. Uh, but in the board meeting, I was discussing it, and uh, they said, yeah, if you're interested in running, we can uh, send you to the party and all that. And then just as an afterthought, oh, got a memo from party leadership. We, they're looking for someone who might want to run in Congressional District 5. And it's like, well, what are you talking about? Like, well, they want to have someone on the ballot, but no one wants to step up because this is a really conservative district, and Matt Salmon's unbeatable. Uh, some of you may share a trait that I have. Uh, I have a problem with authority and not having options. <laughs> so I said, well, if no one else will do it, I'll do it. And I know I'm baby-faced, and everyone else on the, bo on the board is in their 50s or 60s, and they, <laughs> uh, they laughed and said, are you even old enough to run for Congress? And I said, <laughs> And I was a little indignant and said, I'm old enough to run for president. I just may not look like it. So uh, they basically, this, the party said, well, we can't dedicate any kind of uh, resources to your campaign, but go for it. I said, okay. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did nearly, even remotely as well, without my fantastic ca campaign team that I have to give a shout out to. Uh, I'm sure some of you know at least a couple of them. Uh, Evan Clark, formerly of the Secular Student Alliance. Uh, absolutely. 
Sarah Blaine, uh, who was my speechwriter and just generally awesome person, and uh, J.P. Martin, who I am wearing. He gave me for my birthday this year some very fancy uh, wool cashmere socks that I'm wearing on stage, <laughs> that I pro and they're uh, uh, bright, and I'll show you them to you later if you'd like. It's important to be out, and granted, if you don't want to run for office, I get it. It's a lot of work. It's really frustrating. It feels like you're you know, slamming your head against the wall every day for nine to 14 months. But the opportunities to get out there and say, look, I may not believe in supernatural beings, but I'm a decent person. And I want to make things better. And I want to help uh, people get health care. I want to help kids get access to education. I want uh, LGBTQ equal rights. I want better protections for uh, people of minority faiths. I, I just stand up and make your voice heard and be part of the conversation because just being there changes it. People have a hard time being directly offensive and ob objectifying you and pigeonholing you if you're in their face, especially if you're there smiling at them. They really hate that. It's been a fantastic opportunity to get a chance to be in the public eye, and the other reason why it's good to do is it gets you out of your comfort zone and out of your bubble. You learn to speak to people and find common ground. And a lot of times in politics, people just talk past each other. Well, I would go to places and people are like, well, I'm a libertarian and I think everything you stand for is wrong. I'm like, okay. I respect that. Well, give me a specific. And then we start talking. And it turns out they agree with me about 80% of the time on most things. Like, well, I'm a libertarian. Oh, well, then you must be concerned about uh, data privacy and electronic surveillance. Yes, I am. Well, really, my background's in information technology. I know how important that is, and I know what's required and why that's offensive. And it's a d dangerous thing to just have in, with no debate. You can bring people around. And by the end of the conversation, they're like, huh, well, maybe we'll at least consider it. And that's progress. If you come at, it's sort of like judo. If you attack directly back, it's not nearly as effective as using their own energy against them. And you can just kind of direct their line of thinking and reasoning. And just planting that seed of doubt that their position's absolutely correct and is really important, and it's surprisingly easy to do. One downside, you do have to get comfortable speaking in front of groups, and uh, that was never really a problem to me, because I just imagine this is an empty room. <laughs> you're ruining it, you're making noise. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it is politics, so you have to ask for money. That's never fun, but that's another shout out I have to give. The secular community was fantastic to me. Uh, anyone who donated, thank you very much. Anyone who blogged, tweeted, shared one of my Facebook posts, whatever, thank you so much. That was incredibly helpful. The secular community has your back. If you do decide to run, they will help you. They will help you raise money. They will help get your word out. And there's a lot of people out there. and especially people who can't be out and in the public eye themselves, who are more than happy to support candidates and people they view as allies. The part that was the most fun for me on the campaign trail was being strategically controversial. About the third week of officially being in the campaign, Oh, and I do have to tell you one thing. Please go to my uh, public Facebook page. There is a really intense picture of the day after I got my kidney transplant is when I signed my FEC paperwork to run for Congress. And there is a picture of it. I have IVs in, I look disheveled, and my, ca my campaign manager, J.P. Martin, who looks like a uh, uh, catalog uh, fashion model, is handing me the, the paperwork to sign to officially declare my candidacy. It's a great picture. I'm really glad Evan took it. 
it's, it seems like a heavy lift, and it is, but the opportunity it presents to meet people and hear their stories, and speaking openly and honestly about who you are, what you believe, the struggles you've had, whatever they may be, is very disarming. And people would come up to me after speeches I gave and introduce themselves, and they'd tell me their stories about, if I was speaking about health care, they'd talk about their friends or family that struggled and didn't get the care they needed in time and uh, were either injured or passed away because of it. Or if I talked about the separation of church and state, they talked about, uh, someone would come up like, well, I'm an atheist, but my job would probably fire me if I found out. I completely agree with you on all of that. Finding those people and you get to, and and making those connections is really what politics should be. Another uh, story about a week and a half before actual uh, election day, I was out after a fund, uh, fundraiser with the young lady who walked me out, that's Katie Pates, we went, stopped at an outdoor diner place in Phoenix to get some food, because it was late and we hadn't eaten. And a very inebriated man uh, came and approached us, because we were dressed up, uh, and wanted to let us know about his band, because of course he did. Uh, this is a very hipster part of town, by the way. And he asked, uh, he's like, you guys are dressed up, what, what do you do? I'm like, well, actually, I'm running for Congress, I'm a politician. He's like, really? He's like, that's really cool, because you actually listen to people. That's what politicians are supposed to do. And I was like, wow, that's profound, drunk guy, thank you. <laughs> and those are the kind of moments that can only happen when you're on a campaign. Uh, it's gets you out of your comfort zone in ways you never expect. And it's a really fantastic experience, and I highly recommend it. It'll change your life. Uh, you do have to be comfortable with being exposed and just putting yourself out there, but that's, you know, sometimes you gotta do, be a little bit brave to make for the better good. So, uh, now's the part about this. Oh, you can clap with that if you want to. <laughs> Because uh, we are a little short on time, this is the part I like. Uh, please, ask me questions. Uh, I like the conversation, so. So, um, if, if you have questions, now is the time to ask. So, uh, I saw the, the lady right here, uh, and do we have, oh, the mic is coming. Dun, 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 Chariots of Fire. Okay, yet again, not a Memphis song. I don't know what's wrong with me. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, James. Uh, Candy Litchfield from Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> Are you going to run again? Uh, eventually. I am in a federal uh, vocational rehab program. Mm -hmm. If I get a paying gig, they cut off my funding. Oh. Uh, that, and they're willing to pay for me to go to school all the way through uh, a JD or a master's program. And that's what my current plan is. I'm leaning towards a bachelor's from Arizona State's School of Social Transformation, majoring in justice studies, and a bachelor's of interdisciplinary science. I'm going to dual major in political science, uh, social psychology, and communications. So a uh, dual degree in social justice warrior and spin. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm planning on uh, either a law degree or a master's in public administration, and they actually have a dual enrollment program for that as well, so I knew, may do both. I am act, oh, thank you. Yeah. I am active in the party, uh, both for the Arizona Democratic Party. I am the co-chair of the uh, Disabilities Caucus. I'm also on the, uh, uh, I can't think of what it's called, the uh, Affirmative Action Committee, and I am also on the Maricopa County uh, Democratic Party on the Candidate uh, Recruitment and Training Committees. So uh, I will be involved in the party. I will do, be doing a lot of, uh, and I was just recruited off stage by Jamila to do stuff <laughs> uh, so yes, I, I'm not going away. I, 
I, yeah. Yes. Very well. Uh, I saw a question next to this per yes. Yeah, James, during your uh, talk, you mentioned strategic controversy. Could you expand on that a little bit? Sure. You don't want to be caught flat-footed if you're going to do something that's going to create a controversy, like the condoms. The reason why we picked that as an issue that we thought we could get away with it is because most people, even people who profess to be observantly, devoutly religious, realize that and use, often, birth control. And the letter was really offensive, so we wanted to do something about it. They said, basically, it was, if I were to be elected, I would do everything in my power to end access to abortion. Like, well, I don't agree with that whatsoever. So we kind of brainstormed about it, and the, the text of the letter that we wrote back was, we appreciate your goal of trying to reduce the number of abortions, but I feel the most effective way to do that is universal access to birth control, age-appropriate sexual education, and community resources for pregnant mothers. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be a radical statement. And the condom with, like, James Woods for Congress, hashtag prevent abortion, <laughs> is just a little tongue-in-cheek way to get attention. And it worked. Uh, that went pretty viral. Uh, all over the feminist blogs, uh, and it was a very effective tactic. Another controversial thing uh, we did uh, was I shot a video. Uh, I went to a gun show and bought a gun. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, yeah. yeah, I went to a gun show, uh, went and talked to some people, found uh, one, Haggled the guy down 50 bucks, gave him $100, and he, ha and he handed me a revolver. No background check, nothing. The point of it was closing the gun show loophole and just how ridiculous gun laws are in Arizona. Got a little flag for that. Uh, <laughs> but that was what, and the, I say in the video, like, even NRA members support closing the gun show loophole. Something like 40% of firearm sales are through completely unregulated, undocumented gun show purchases. That's millions of firearms a year. And research has shown if it, you create just that tiny barrier, it reduces the amount of gun violence. And not just gun violence against others, that includes uh, self-harm and uh, accidents uh, relating family members, friends, what have you. And that was one of our campaign platforms. We had five, it was equality, reason, compassion, innovation, and sustainability. And that was the lenses we looked at everything we did in all of our policy statements. And just having a consistent message and presenting things in a logical, like, this shouldn't be an outrageous concept. You make policy based on evidence rather than just intuition or the way tradition or whatever. And people seem to respond to it. Excellent. So I have a question for you, James. Sure. Um, uh, we know that you're going to be active and whatnot. For someone who, like you, lives in an area where it can be hard to get your voice heard when they are able to see you as atheist, know you as atheist, and demonize you, what types of things can someone who wishes to still be involved um, as an outsider, as unfortunately sometimes a reviled outs outsider, what can, what can he, she, they do? It really depends on where you live. If you're in a larger city, uh, we have clubs and we meet. Uh, go to meetup.com, what have you. Uh, Phoenix has a lot of them, surprisingly enough. There is a very powerful secular movement in Arizona. Uh, if you live in a more rural area, the internet. Find your people, find your tribe. They're out there. Uh, the internet's a great way to do it. Like, I, that's one of the reasons why I was excited to come here. There's several people uh, that I've only known online that I'm getting to meet in person, and it's a, a fun thing for me. Excellent. Well, uh, I see one last question here. The person in red, I think that's red. The light is right here. Okay, one moment. We're going to ask you to wait for the mic. Thank you. If through some fluke you had won, what would happen? After a uh, slight break, uh, 
mental breakdown. <laughs> I would have moved to Washington, D.C., and I would have continued to fight for the things I believe in. I, I don't have much formal education, but I'm fairly clever. I can pick up on things fast, and I've met politicians. Uh, <laughs> so, I think I can pick it up pretty quick. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you so much, James. This is great. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the opportunity. Yay.